I would mentioned in our Bible class that how precious Shane and Sue are to us. Also, Brother Bobby Edens. I met Bobby back in the mid-70s in Rogersville, Tennessee, when I became the preacher there. And man, they blew me away. Him and his dad, when they sang, he bore it all, they bore it all. And that beautiful bass and the Edens family from that time till this time have been dear friends of mine and Betty's. And we love them and appreciate them. And we know you're honored to have him as one of your song leaders here. And Bobby, we love you. Appreciate you and your family. We talked about in our Bible class the book of Genesis and how we learn many messages from that great book of beginnings, especially from paradise. Now we're going to go to the other end of the spectrum and we're going to talk about a message that we receive, our messages from torment. And you might think, well, what kind of messages can we receive from torment? Well, we can receive some very important messages. And one of those messages that we learn from torment is universal. Salvation is not universal. Not everyone, as much as we may love to have it true, and even as much as God would love to have it true, not everyone is going to be, of course, in a saved category. That's why Jesus uttered these words in the Sermon on the Mount, Enter in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leads unto life, few there be that find it. So in that passage of Scripture we learn from torment that many are going to travel the broad way that leads to destruction. They're going to go in thereat. And then the Scripture that we had read in our hearing earlier. Not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, enters the kingdom, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. For many, not a few, but many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Cast out devils in thy name and done many wonderful works. Then will I profess unto them, that's unto the many, I never knew you, depart from me, ye that work lawlessness or iniquity. And so when you look at the passage of Scripture, a message comes ringing loud and clear from torment that life eternal is not universal. God died for, or the Son of God died and tasted death for every man. It's not God's will that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But because men are free moral agents and they give in to the lust of the flesh and want to do what they want to do instead of what God says, many are going to enter the broad way that leads to destruction. So we need to learn a message this morning from torment that a place of salvation is not a place where everyone is going to be, only those that are obedient to the will of God. Jesus, of course, teaches very clearly that though he were a son, yet learned the obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect became the author of eternal salvation, and to all of them that obey him. But there's another message that we hear from torment that's very important to us, and that is that physical death is not the end. Now we think sometimes because when life ends that our life is over that nothing else is going to happen. Well that's not true and we'll allude to this on other passages in a moment from Luke 16 where the rich man and Lazarus both died and faced God in eternity. But it says in Luke 16, 22 and 23, so it was the beggar died and he was carried by angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried and being in torments in Hades lifted up his eyes saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Now notice this story is telling us about two men, two men that are in eternity. One of those men's lost, the other man is saved, but they're in eternity. And as a million years, as you and I count time occurs, we will be somewhere at that time. We're not going to cease to exist when we die physically. And a lot of people, I think, think like the dog Rover when he's dead, he's just dead all over. That happens to us, but it doesn't. While we are having our physical bodies placed in the ground, our soul lives on and on and on. In all eternity, our soul will live on. And so this rich man lifts up his eyes in torments. His body is in the ground. His soul is in Hades. And here he is suffering. And therefore, when he died, it wasn't over. A lot of times people think that might be the case. You know, the Apostle Paul helped relative to this too. He said, for me to live is Christ." But to die is gain. Now he's talking about physical death. So how could one gain in physical death? If I live, he says, in Christ, then that's okay. But if I die, he said, that is even far 
better. And so he says, if I live in the flesh, this is the mean of the fruit of the spirit of my labor, yet I choose not, I cannot tell, for I am in a strait between the twixt, having the desire, desire to depart and to be with God, which is far better. Desire to depart and to be with God, not depart and cease to exist. And so one of the messages that comes back loud and clear from torment is, Death is not the end of my life. My life will be an eternal life. When I was made in the beginning in the likeness and image of God when mankind was, then folks, that sealed it. We're going to live forever. Once we come into the world, we're going to forever live somewhere. And so we learn a very important lesson. Next lesson that we learn, the message we receive from eternity that comes in again, loud and clear, is that there is no second chance. Now, we've got to make a good of this now because when we die, there's no second chance. Hebrews 9, 27 says, It's appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. See, there's not going to be a second chance. I think some people think, well, we'll invent one. We'll invent purgatory. We'll invent some kind of thing. One fellow told me one time he'd been baptized for a thousand dead people. A thousand dead people. I don't care if he's been baptized so much his flesh looks like a prune. You cannot be baptized for someone that's dead. They made their choice, and once they made it and once they died, that choice is forever sealed. They're not going to be able to change that. The rich man, once he died and lifted up his eyes being in, in torments in Hades, that would never change. Now, we've lived a long time after that, and we'll see in a moment when we read more from that event that this man died under the law of Moses. Well, after that time came the law of Christ, New Testament Christianity. For some 2,000 years over, now we've been living under New Testament Christianity. That man's still in eternity. His soul is still in torment in the flame. And therefore, he is suffering greatly as a result of that. And that will never change. He will forever be there, which sends us another message. There's not going to be a second chance, no purgatory, no baptism for the dead, none of that. We die, and then we face the judgment. There is not going to be someone going to come back from the dead and give you a message. You know, they got these nuance and people that they say communicates with the dead. One lady was the other day on TV and she talked about how that she would go to family reunions and they would call and call and call and call and bring someone back into that family reunion from the dead and they could sense their presence and so on. Once you die and you go into the grave, you're not going to come back and be able to converse with those that are on earth. Now, that rich man thought this might be a possibility. Now, turn and look at Luke 16, verses 27 to 31, and watch this conversation that I think is kind of interesting between this rich man that's in eternity now, and he's conversing with Abraham. Notice that Abraham, notice this rich man, this poor beggar, all of these guys are individuals that lived on earth, and now they're living in eternity. And here Abraham is. But then this beggar says, or this rich man says, then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him, that's someone back from the dead, to my father's house. I have five brothers that they may testify to them lest they come to this place of torment. Now stop the reading there just a moment. What is this man saying? Well, he's saying, look, I got five brothers. I got five brethren that's still living back on earth. Obviously, they're on earth living there because they're not where I am. And he knew the kind of life that they had been living back on earth, and it was the kind of living that when they died, they were going to come to where he was. Have you ever heard someone say something like, well, if my mother's lost, then I'll just be lost too. Or if my brother's lost, or if my relative is lost, or if somebody that they knew is lost, I'll just be lost. They talk about being lost or going to hell like you and I talk about going down to Walmart or some place in town. Just common, common language. And they're using it as if it's not a big deal. Friends, if they've got anybody, their mother, their brother, their sister, anybody that loves them, that's lost in torment, their prayer from the tops of their voices today are, don't come where I am. And you know what? They won't have to be there that long. 
They won't want uh, to be with them. They'll be wanting out of there. They won't be there a second. It's not fun and games like people make it. It's not like going to Walmart or the store or someplace else. Friend, going into torment to be lost in punishment forever and ever and ever unendingly is not a place where you want to go or a place where anyone that's there wants you to be. Now, wouldn't that not have, though, been wonderful if this man that's now in torment in Hades, had had the interest in his five brethren while he was on earth that he has in them now? What if he'd have been evangelistic then? Why wait till you die and go into eternity lost before you get interested in your friends and your kinsmen and people you know back on earth? We need to do what we can do for God now to keep us and them from the place of torment. You see, they don't want you where they are. We don't want to be where they are. And so he's asking, seeking, becoming evangelistic nature. And in mind now, to be concerned about his five brothers that he knows are not living a life that they should be living. They're in a place of torment. So Abraham said to him, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. Now, what does that add up to? That adds up to the fact they have the word of God Through Moses and the prophets, let them hear the word of God. What's wrong with hearing the word of God? Why is that such a bad deal? Why is that something people don't want to do? Why would they want to do something else or listen to someone else or follow someone else other than the word of God? They've got Moses and the prophets, let them hear them they've got the law under which they live the word of God has provided for them let them listen to what the law of Moses and the prophets have to say and they'll be okay but evidently this rich man knew I didn't listen to them my five brethren weren't listening to them and so I am praying that God will make a change that there'll be something different the word of God is still today the power of God to salvation And if I won't hear the word of God, I'm not going to be persuaded to hear God in anybody's voice. If I'm not going to listen to God, I'm sure not going to listen. They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And now watch the rich man's conversation. But he says, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes unto them from the dead, they will repent. Now that's an assumption and a false one at that. Can you imagine someone coming back from the dead and telling someone that somebody they love and knows lost? Not my, not my mom, not my dad, not my friend. No, sir, they're not lost. He's mistaken. He doesn't know something's wrong. He's lying to me. They're not lost. I knew them, and I know they're okay. They wouldn't believe someone that rose from the dead that told them their loved one is lost. You think those five brethren, if they don't believe what Moses says and they don't believe what the prophets teach, if they're going to listen to somebody else? that supposedly came from the dead, that's passing on information to them now, you got a brother lost. you got a brother in torment. you got a brother suffering. Don't go where he is. They wouldn't listen to that. He said they're not going to be persuaded. The one rose and went back from the dead, but the message from torment is no one is going to come back from the dead. No one's going to talk to you from the dead. If you don't listen to Moses and the prophets, and in our case, to Jesus Christ and follow New Testament Christianity, we couldn't be persuaded by anything. The Bible has been given demonstrative proof that the Word of God is true and it's sufficient to save our souls and to provide us with everything that's necessary for life and for godliness. We got the book. I'm not ashamed. Paul said of the book. It's the power of God unto salvation. The word of God is quick. It's powerful. It's sharper than any two-edged sword piercing even the dividing of sunder of joints and spirits and soul and marrow as a discerner of thoughts and intents of the heart. The word of God is alive and active and powerful and it's God's will. And it's God's means of communicating his mind to Christ's mind and to your mind that you can follow him. Though one rose from the dead, they would not be persuaded. He said, oh, they'll repent if one went back from the dead and warned them. He said to him, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither would they be persuaded. Though one rose from the dead, that is the truth of the matter. That's it. No ifs, ands, buts, 
about it. They wouldn't believe someone that rose from the dead and went back and told them. Even if they told them that, they wouldn't believe that for a minute. So Paul said, look, the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. Peter would say very clearly, the word of God is the seed. And in it we have, the, in that seed, the power to convert lives and to change lives of men and women that will follow the word of God if they will, but just listen to what the word of God has to say to them. And so Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now, what have we seen? We've had messages through the word of God from the dead, from those that are in torment that says salvation is not universal. Death is not the end. There is no second chance. There'll be no message from the dead that will warn you and give you the advice. And then the last message that we learned that we want to emphasize is that death in torment, being lost, is the most terrible thing ever. No one has ever experienced pain like the pain they're going to be experiencing if they die lost. You don't have to die lost. I don't have to die lost. The good news of the kingdom, the good news of the word of God, the gospel is you can and must and can be saved if you just do what God says to do. Is that so difficult? Why will we listen to the dictates of men, the ideology of men, the opinions of men? Why will that take precedent over what God's word says? We always lose when we listen to men and fail to listen to God. Jeremiah was right when he said it's not in man that walks to direct his own steps. Solomon was right when he said, he who puts his trust in his own heart is a fool, but he that walks wisely shall be delivered. Jesus was right when he said, in vain do they worship me teaching for doctrine, the commandments of men. Why will we choose the commandments of men? Because we don't believe that being lost is a terrible thing. Now when you go back to Luke 16, 23 and 24, being in torments in Hades. He lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off, Lazarus in his bosom. And then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Let Lazarus dip the tip of his finger in water. Cool my tongue, I'm in torments. I'm in torments. I'm being tormented in this flame. That was over 3,000 years ago. And he's still in torments in the flame. 3,000 years ago. And he's still in the flame. 3,000 years from now, he'll be in torments in the flame. 10,000 years from now, a million years from now, as we count time, unending amount of time, this man's going to be crying out, have mercy on me. And there is no mercy extended to those that are lost. Dying in sin is horrible. Nothing is more horrible than a person dying lost and dying in sin to be cast into hell. Now notice he said, Lazarus, in, remember in this lifetime, in your past lifetime, you had it made. You lived in the house on the hill. You had all you wanted. You, could have, you were living high, wide, fat, and sassy. Anything you wanted, you could get. Who wanted to be that poor beggar? What would you do if you were walking downtown Greenville and there's a guy laying on the street? The dogs are all around him. They're licking him. They're licking his sores. What would you do? Many of us would probably cross the road and go down the other side of the street. Who wants to be around a man laying in a, in on the ground being licked by dogs full of sores? God said of him in this life, he was being tormented. But you were being comforted. You think that rich man ever entertained the idea, I'd like to change places with him? I'd like to switch the rows and let me be the beggar for a while and let him be the rich man. You think he ever had that idea? I doubt it. Would you have had it? Would you have ever entertained that idea? And he says, but now. And that but now ought to linger in our hearts unendingly. But now. 
when it really matters. But now when life is eternal, but now when you have no second chance, but now, when you lift up your eyes in torment, look at him. He's being comforted. You think that rich man, if he could come back to this earth today, would say, give me the beggar's position and give him all of the riches that he could ever attain because when it's over, it is over. Now, I want to hasten to say this man, Rich, was not lost because he was rich. A lot of rich men have died and gone to heaven or gone to paradise in a safe position. A lot of beggars have died lost. It wasn't because he was rich or poor. It was because one did the will of God and one didn't, Matthew 7, 21 to 23. But in this world, he was comforted. You were comforted. He was tormented. But now he's comforted and you're tormented. And this don't change. It changed on earth, but it don't change. Now the rich fool said, I'll tear down my barns. I'll build bigger barns. I'll say to my soul, take much goods laid up for many years. Take thy soul and rest, eat, drink, be merry. You got it made. And God called him a fool and said, tonight you die. You die tonight. Then the words that rang through his heart through all eternity, and then who shall these things be? All your wealth won't mean no more than a rock on this parking lot when you die. And the only thing that's going to matter is not where you were rich or poor now, but whether you were faithful or unfaithful to God. That's all that's going to matter. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou have much goods laid up for many years. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. Paul said when he was writing to the church over at Thessalonica in 2 Thessalonians 1, that Jesus would come in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ who will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Jesus said these will go away into everlasting life, but the, right, the uh, wicked will be in everlasting punishment. Matthew 25, verse 46. What a horrible thing to look at and to think about that we should die lost. But there's a final message I want to share. It's amazing to me how when I read my Bible, I'll be in a chapter and it's gloom and doom. Gloom and doom. I'm teaching the book of Isaiah this quarter. And there are parts in the book of Isaiah where it's nothing but doom and gloom. You're going to pay for your sins. You want, chose iniquity and now you're going to reap iniquity, the rewards of it. And then all of a sudden, boom, there's a ray of light, hope, in a passage right in the middle of all that. Like in Genesis 3, we didn't get there this morning, but had we done so, Genesis 3, 15, there's God hated for Calvary after man had sinned. What a blessing, what a beautiful passage. And involved in all of this gloom and doom, there seems to be this ray of hope, this passage that stands out that says to me, there is comfort there is comfort in being a faithful child of God. Luke 16, 25, son, remember, in your lifetime you received good things, Lazarus evil things, but now he's comforted and you're tormented. I don't know the thoughts that were entertained in the mind of that beggar, but you reckon he ever thought, man, I'm going through a lot. I've got sores. I don't even have the ability to maneuver around. Somebody has to take me and lay me at the gate hoping I can get some crumbs from the table. You reckon he ever thought, God, thank you for your blessings on me? I don't have a lot of material things, but I've got you. You're my comfort and my strength. You're my very present help in the time of troubles. I don't know what all he entertained in his mind and his thinking, but I know he died faithful. I know he died faithful. So I know that he was relying on the mercy of God, the grace of God, the love of God, the devotion of God, the consistency of God to be with him no matter what he may suffer in life. Because you see, he knew something that the poor or the rich man didn't know or didn't think of. I'm not going to turn back now. The best is yet to come. And now, 3,000 years plus later, He's still comforted. He's still being blessed. You think he believes he made a good choice? He made the best choice that could have been made. We can make that choice. Here's a message 
in all of this of comfort. He has his good things. He is comforted. So in this event was a message of comfort. I hope we get comfort in knowing that things in life get tough sometimes and we go through our ups and our downs, but God is always with us. He's always by our side. He's always helping us. He's always that present help in the time of trouble. He is our God. He is our strength. He is our salvation. As God told Israel of old, don't fear them. Don't fear Egypt. Don't fear Assyria. I'll fight for you. Does it mean anything to you to know that God is fighting for you this morning? He's on your side. And the best is yet to come. That's comfort and hope. To the child of God, there's nothing but blessings to come out of this. If you're not a child of God, you need to hear the word of God, Romans 10, 17. Believe with all your heart, Jesus Christ, Son of God, John 8, 24. Repent of your sin, Luke 13, 3. Confess him before men, Matthew 10. And be baptized into Christ for the remission of your sins, Acts 2, 38, Acts 22, 16. A race to walk in newness of life. You see, you're baptized into Christ, and the Lord adds you to his body, the church, over which he's the head over which he's the Savior, over which he gives you the hope you need. All spiritual blessings are in Christ. Maybe you're in Christ, but you haven't been faithful. You haven't been faithful. Maybe you're like the rich man. You've been busy accumulating stuff or whatever it might be that's hindering you from being faithful. You need to repent. You won't get any message from the grave other than what you're getting from the Word of God. May God help you make a right choice. To hit, repent and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart might be forgiven you. Acts 8, verse 22. And if you'll be faithful till you die, you can receive that crown of life. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, please come as we stand and as we sing the invitation song. <laughs>